So heroin and the opiates loom large in data on deaths. Uh, I have copies of these slides. I'll leave a limited uh, version of the slides for people to look at uh, later if they wish. So globally, the number of deaths from opioids continues to rise, and there are now well in excess of 100,000 opiate-related deaths per annum. A particularly dire situation currently exists in the US, where there are three overlapping epidemics. Uh, firstly, deaths from prescription opioids, uh, tripling over the last 15 years, followed by a more recent uh, steeper onset epidemic of heroin overdose deaths over the last five years, and now further complicated uh, over the last couple of years by a rapid increase in deaths from illicitly manufactured fentanyl and its analogues. And to get this in perspective, opioid overdose deaths now exceed deaths from road traffic accidents. So let's check we understand why heroin overdose deaths occur. So uh, working with creatives from the arts part of King's, uh, we've developed an animation to explain what happens. This is one of those risky bits of work that one does. So, uh. so we can see uh, the molecules of heroin arriving at the opioid receptor uh, where they dampen down the respiratory centers uh, with consequent failure of sending of the signals to breathe. It's as if the wire has come loose in the signal pathway. Uh, to those of you wondering whether I ever went to anatomy or physiology classes, I, I'm aware that, that, <laughs> that this isn't a completely accurate representation. So not only we do, do we know who is at risk, we also now know times of particular concentration of these deaths. Uh, these are generally points of transition, either when moving from street drugs into treatment or in the weeks following the end of treatment and rehabilitation. So a particular con concentration is in the weeks uh, that follow release from prison. So let's look at the findings uh, from a study by colleagues uh, here within addictions uh, here at the Institute. And we can see in the right-hand side of the graph the excess mortality in a prison release population. Uh, with about half of this excess mortality, uh, the purple bands being from drug overdose deaths. However, look at the horrific concentration of deaths in the first two columns. So that's the first week and the second week after release from prison. So we can study patterns of overdose deaths, you know, but what are we going to do about it? So first, we can have impact by conceiving of new types of intervention. And secondly, we can then have impact by influencing policy and practice. And thirdly, we can have impact by application of better science to improve our interventions. So first of all, the concept. Just over 20 years ago, as part of exploring possible new harm reduction approaches to reduce the damage caused by drug use, we realized that many lives could be saved by mobilizing the general public, including drug users themselves and families, as an emergency intervention workforce. Uh, we already had a crucial tool in the emergency management of opioid overdose in emergency naloxone, uh, an injection widely used to treat heroin overdose in the emergency room and by ambulance crews. So what does naloxone actually do? Well, go, going back to our animation, uh, we can see that the naloxone, and we all know that naloxone is blue, uh, it, it appears at the opiate receptor where it displaces the heroin and thereby essentially just restores the normal function of signals for breathing. So from this, we developed the concept of take-home naloxone as public health provision. And in a manifesto declaration in the BMJ way back in 1996, we articulated this approach, uh, laying out the key steps for its practical implementation. And we then began the first studies testing its feasibility and acceptability to target populations of drug users themselves in and out of treatment, uh, and to their families also, uh, who are very much an overlooked 
but important intervention workforce. And we were also helped in communicating this concept by a former student uh, called Quentin Tarantino, uh, who developed the famous overdose scene in Pulp Fiction. And just in case anyone's confused, no, he wasn't really a student here. Uh, but we do actually think that he got the idea from one of the researchers working closely with me at the time, uh, in whose house Tarantino would uh, frequently stay when he was writing the script from the film. I, I just wish we could prove that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next on to policy and practice. The, there's no point having a public health approach if it isn't actually implemented. So there was initial shock and opposition to the idea of take-home naloxone, and particularly to the idea that drug users themselves could be an intervention workforce. Nevertheless, we managed to establish a patchy international network of bold innovators and early adopters, and it was shown to be feasible as an approach, and there were a growing number of reports of lives saved. But laws needed to be changed, guidelines needed to be written, governments and regulatory endorsement were crucial. Uh, so by 2005 in the UK, we were contributing to the revision of the law in the UK, uh, which allowed any member of the general public to administer an injection of naloxone for the purpose of saving a life. Uh, and then in the late 2000s, the Department of Health supported a national in initiative across England with pilot schemes providing overdose training and naloxone provision. And then uh, Scotland became the first country uh, to incorporate provision of take-home naloxone as an integral part of treatment provision to individuals with heroin addiction problems, and Wales followed soon thereafter. Uh, then by 2014, we were working with WHO to develop the first ever international guidelines on training and support uh, for training and naloxone to be provided to drug users themselves and their families. And then 2016, uh, this is taken as a new essential treatment endorsed not only by WHO, uh, by, but by the United Nations General Assembly. And uh, most recently in the UK, uh, the guidelines have been changed, uh, the regulations have been changed uh, to make more widespread availability of take on naloxone uh, without a prescription to drug users, their families, partners, anyone who might be there at a future overdose soon. It's also important uh, to consider the cultural transferability of any new approach and also to look, at, look after your own needs for traveling the world. Uh, and so here's a team photo from our naloxone planning visit, uh, meeting with a strong self-help group in Tajikistan. I have to say, some of them I really wouldn't have wanted to mess with. Some of them were pretty serious um, activists. Okay, so finally, uh, we want to have impact from better science. We want to, to understand the process of delivery of benefit, and we, we want to identify ways of improving the benefit and to improve the product itself. Uh, for example, improved forms of naloxone. So an, uh, an early modest step uh, in the science was our first ever prospective cohort study of individuals uh, to whom take-home naloxone had been given, studying observationally uh, the increase in their knowledge, their confidence, and their competence. Uh, we also then began to introduce randomized trial design to the studies of take-home naloxone, uh, such as a uh, randomized trial of overdose training with family members, testing the increase in their knowledge and confidence and its robustness over a three-month period compared with a waiting list control group. And we also began a bold prison release randomized trial. We'd seen that prison release was a point of particularly intense overdose deaths, so uh, it was an obvious point uh, to study, although challenging to do so. And we were testing whether the pre-provision of a naloxone pack at the point of release would reduce the frequency of overdose deaths in those weeks immediately after prison release. So the idea is it's a bold and challenging study, but one where we can bring science to the area, even though it's particularly challenging. And we also wanted to draw on the breadth of potential scientific method and to gain important insights from use of qualitative research methods. 
And so through research interviews, exploring the lived experiences of drug users themselves, we found that for many drug users, the actual experience of having saved someone's life had a profound effect on their perceptions of themselves and also it appeared on their own subsequent drug use. So perhaps there are ways in which we could harness this change in self-perception to promote more responsibility around future personal drug use. But we also learned of potential negative unintended consequences. So this included over-antagonism, where excessive naloxone was being administered, triggering not only restoration of breathing, uh, but also precipitating full-blown cold turkey. Now, some of you might say, well, so what? At least they're alive. Uh, but this triggers more than just cold turkey. Uh, it became clear that it was triggering hostility from the abrupt wakening with potential risk to the resuscitator. And it also triggered desperate drug seeking to counter the excessive naloxone effect with real risk of further drug use and further overdose as the naloxone there wore off. So without listening to these lived experiences, we'd not have realized the importance of these positive and negative unexpected effects. So far, so good. Uh, but it became clear that there were inherent difficulties from the point of view uh, of public and politicians with an approach that required giving an injectable drug, even though it was an antidote, to those who themselves already had a problem with injecting drug use. So we began to question whether naloxone really needed to be given by injection, even though that's how for 50 years it's always been given. Uh, and we identified the feasibility in principle of a concentrated naloxone nasal spray. And uh, working with industry as well as with academic partners, we undertook pharmacokinetic uh, studies to produce a new concentrated naloxone nasal spray. And it became clear that the naloxone solution needed to be 20 times more concentrated uh, and in much smaller unit volume and we identified from healthy volunteer studies that its bioavailability was between 40 to 50%. So this was an acceptable bioavailability, uh, and it had sufficiently rapid speed of onset to address the emergency situation, and so it's now an approved new medicine with regulatory approval across Europe since 2018. But now we want to make good better. Uh, so Concentrated naloxone nasal spray may seem good, but it also has limitations. Not all overdose victims have intact nasal mucosa. In fact, some of them have been spending quite a number of years damaging their nasal mucosa uh, with scarring, or they may have colds, or they may have hay fever, uh, or they may have vomit or pulmonary uh, exudate obstructing their nasal passages, passages directly as a result of the overdose. So working with colleagues in pharmaceutical sciences, uh, we've shown the ability to develop uh, a rapid dispersal lyophilized wafer of naloxone, suitable for application inside the cheek as a buccal wafer. Uh, and we hope to secure an industry partner to help us uh, with the next stage of this exploration. So finally, let me also mention briefly our most recent venture in what might be termed extreme science. Uh, we need to understand heroin overdose better. Uh, so we need a setting uh, in which to study both overdose and its reversal. So it's logical, let's just reconstruct heroin overdose in the laboratory. Uh, so we've brought heroin users into our experimental wards at the, the clinical research facility and in this way, we can now study the respiratory arrest that characterizes acute heroin overdose. So what happens when somebody injects heroin? So here we can see the respiratory measures from a heroin user prior to injecting heroin. Uh, in the top line, uh, the pattern of breathing is shown, and you can see it's reasonably stable. And then in the middle line, uh, we can see the stable blood oxygen levels from pulse oximetry. And in the lower line, uh, you can see the expected rise and fall of carbon dioxide uh, in expired air. So that's, that's the normal pattern. 
Now let's look at what happens five to 10 minutes after heroin injection. We can see remarkable disturbance to this breathing pattern with long apneic episodes. So remind you, that's again, that's the top line. Uh, so you've got uh, episodes lasting up to 56, 56 seconds with this individual. Uh, I was going to ask you all to hold your breath for 56 seconds to get a sense of what that was like, but I don't think time permits it. Uh, and you can see that the rising CO2 levels are not triggering the breathing that one's expecting to see, and a consequent drop in the oxygen levels uh, down to the upper 80s. And even an hour later, we're seeing much the same picture. Uh, so with the ability to recreate these events in the laboratory, we have the ability to study the processes and then also to test the effects of reversal. In addition, it gives us the opportunity to explore possible new technologies to perhaps to detect these overdose events and then perhaps even to intervene through wearable devices or wearable clothing to detect an overdose event and thereby to activate an emergency call. But uh, that's an idea that's still in early development. So let me conclude. Uh, we've had impact through the original conception and development of the idea of take-home naloxone and associated overdose training. We've had an impact on policy and practice at local, national, and international levels. And we've had impact through advancement of science with better quality studies and development of improved products. For those uh, wanting to know more, there's a monograph uh, we prepared in 2016 for the EMCDDA. It's the European Monitoring Center uh, for Drugs and Drug Dependence. And we have some complimentary copies, which if anybody wants a copy, uh, I'm happy to uh, give people a copy. Uh, and within this, uh, there's also uh, the identification of the need for take-home naloxone to become a standard of care a requirement for clinicians uh, to discharge as part of their duty of care to their patients. There's still much to do. There is frequently poor quality of provision, and there are areas of darkness where this novel approach is uh, either resisted or not even considered. We must challenge this institutional inertia, just as we must challenge the stigma around uh, tackling overdose and addictions, which often stand in the way of reachable progress. And it'll be through better science, accompanied by more effective advocacy and clinical leadership, that we harness our ability to have a real impact on reducing deaths from opioid overdose. Thank you very much.